right, amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Josh and Sarah Harbison. And so we're excited that you guys have come. Again, want to encourage you to check out the question and answer time uh, that we had online. If you didn't get to see it, he goes into a lot of information. I will let you know if you haven't got to see or hear any of those. He is a Tennessee volunteer fan. It's a tough life. I tell you what, it's going to get interesting. It would if uh, he gets voted in, and uh, it'd be interesting. Missouri and Florida Gators, which is the best one. Uh, and then Alabama, and then Tennessee on staff. Can you imagine? Oh, whew, it's crazy stuff. But uh, we are excited to have them here, and you're going to get an opportunity to discuss more about them uh, at 3 o'clock and then uh, for a vote. Uh, so I would encourage you to come back at that time. Well, we're in a new series this year, and we are celebrating the 20th anniversary of our Baptist Faith and Message 2000. What we would call 20 years ago, the conservative resurgence, a group of godly men and women got together and said, we need to fight for the Bible, that we believe this is the word of God. And so we stand upon it. And so this year we're going to be celebrating uh, some of the aspects of the Baptist faith and message 2000, which I am here today to tell you, I am proud to be a Christian, a follower of Christ, and I am proud to be a Southern Baptist. We are the largest mission-sending agency on planet Earth. We believe in reaching the lost for Christ. And what do we believe is laid out for us in a summation known as the Baptist Faith and Message 2000 version. And so this shows us exactly what we believe. And so we're going to be spending a majority of this year diving into what we believe. And I think this is going to be a great opportunity for us to really engage our thought process to figure out who we are as Christians, to figure out what we really believe about the Word of God and about who God is and what He's called us to do. And so we're going to begin this series starting with really who is God, this great big question. We're spending about eight weeks diving into some of the deep aspects about who God is. We're going to be looking at, yes, the Baptist uh, faith and message as that summation, but we're going to be diving into many series, if you will, along the way to get us to the point to understand more in depth about what God's Word says, which as I think about being a Southern Baptist, I want to encourage you, if you've thought about going to the Southern Baptist Convention or are interested in going, we want to give you an invite. If you are a member of Ridgecrest Baptist Church, you can be a messenger from Ridgecrest. Uh, this year, the dates are June 9th through the 10th, and it's going to be in Orlando, Florida. I know that place well. Uh, so there are 10 spots available. Normally we get 12, but my wife and I will be attending the Southern Baptist Convention like we did last year. We're going to be attending it again this year. So if you're interested, please let the church office know so we can get you voted in as a messenger when I'm voted in as well uh, as a messenger. And so we can take care of that. But we are excited about that. Well, in this series, it's going to last all the way up until October. We're talking this eight-week series starting with who is God. In order to figure out who God is, we must start with the basis that there is a God. Now, due to time today, uh, we're not going to be diving into the essence of how to prove the existence of God. We're not there uh, in our lesson today. Also, when we talk about what we're going to be talking about today, I'm, I'm preaching from the perspective of we're home folk, we're family, we're, we know that there is a God. And so we're going to start off with that premise. And the very fact that we know that there's a God is we can look around, and the world does, at the things around like nature and beauty and the animals and human beings and the sky and the universe and say, you know what, all this did not happen by chance. That obviously there has to be some divine being that created everything. And so when we think about this, this is the concept known as natural or general revelation. That we can look around and say there is a God that established and created everything. Which then leads us into the question is, well, then how do we know who this correct God is? Well, Paul talked about this general natural revelation and how it works in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 20. He said this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly perceived even since the creation of the world itself. And in the things that have been made, so they are therefore without excuse. We can go overseas right now to unreached people groups that have not been touched by, if you will, domesticated human being lifestyles and things of that nature. We can go to them and we'll look at them and we'll see that they're worshiping some form of deity or even spirits because they even believe 
all of this just couldn't happen by chance. And so when we think about this issue, we know that there is a God. Then the question naturally should be, how do we know who this God is? And in order to determine that, who this God is, we have to recognize what we then call special revelation. And that has been given to us by God. That special revelation is the revealed word of God. We call it the Bible, the holy scriptures that God has established for us. Now listen, we don't have time today to go through all of scripture. I was debating on coming and saying, hey, we're going to start in Genesis 1 today and let's just start going. 80 hours later, we're in Genesis chapter 5. You know, it's just the reality of what we're doing. And so we're not going to cover that, but I want to give you a little summation of the scriptures as put forth by a group known as the Bible Project. And so a short three-minute clip here for you to be able to see, but I think this does a great job of giving you kind of a summation of where uh, we're talking about today. The Bible. It's one of the most influential books in human history. It explores the big questions of why we exist. It's inspired many people to do amazing things. And confused many others. And you've probably got one sitting around somewhere. So, what is the Bible actually? Well, the Bible is a small library of books that all emerged out of the history of the people of ancient Israel. And in one sense, they were just like any other ancient civilization. But among them were a long line of individuals called prophets. And they viewed Israel's story as anything but ordinary. They saw it as a central part of what God was doing for all humanity. And these prophets were literary geniuses. Really? Yeah, they expertly crafted the Hebrew language to write epic narratives, very sophisticated poetry. They were masters of metaphor and storytelling. And they leveraged all of this to explore life's most complicated questions about death and life and the human struggle. So there's a lot of different authors writing this book. Yeah, and these texts were produced over a thousand year period, starting with Israel's origins in Egypt, then leading up to their kingdom with their first temple. But eventually they were conquered by the Babylonians who took them away into exile. Then, at a crucial moment in their history, many Israelites returned to their land. They built a second temple, they reformed their identity, and this is when the Jewish scriptures began to be formed into the shape that we have them today. Okay, the Jewish Bible, what's in it? Well, in Hebrew, it's called by an acronym, Tanakh. The T stands for Torah, sometimes called the Law. That's Israel's five book foundation story. The N stands for Nevi'im, the Hebrew word for prophets. And this section consists of the historical books that tell Israel's story from the prophet's point of view. Then you get the poetic books of the prophets themselves. The K stands for Ketavim, the Hebrew word for writings. This is a diverse collection of poetic books, wisdom books, and more narrative. And the Jewish people believe that through all of these literary works, God speaks to his people. Now, there were other Jewish writings being produced during this second temple period as well. Yeah, a really diverse group of texts. And these two were highly valued in Jewish communities. And there was debate from ancient times about whether or not some of these should be considered part of their scriptures. So this is a lot of different writings over a long period of time. Why did they put them all together like this? Well, altogether, these texts tell an epic story about how God is working through these people to bring order and beauty out of the chaos of our world. And it all builds up to a hope for a new leader who would come and renew all creation. And then the Tanakh concludes, and this leader never comes. So it's an expertly crafted work, but it's missing an ending? That's exactly right. Now, a few centuries later, a Jewish prophet comes onto the scene named Jesus of Nazareth. He claimed he was carrying the Tanakh story forward. Yeah, so Jesus did a bunch of cool stuff was killed, but his followers claimed he was alive from the dead. Yeah, they said that Jesus was that long-awaited leader who would restore the world. And so his earliest followers, called apostles, they composed new literary works about the story of Jesus. They called these good news or the gospel. They formed an account called Acts about the spread of the Jesus movement outside of Israel. And then they circulated letters to different Jesus communities all around the ancient world. And they saw these writings as part of the scripture. Yeah, the apostles wrote all of this as the fulfillment of that epic story found in the Tanakh. And they were continuing the literary genius of the Jewish tradition. They also believed that God was speaking to his people through these texts alongside the scriptures of Israel. So that's the Old and New Testament. Perfect. 
A little great summation there of what we see in the Bible. And so today we're going to talk about the scriptures. The Baptist faith and message, to sum up what they say, this is what it's read as the scriptures. The Holy Bible was written by men divinely inspired and is God's revelation of himself to man. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. Therefore, all scripture is totally true and trustworthy. It reveals the principles by which God judges us and therefore is and will remain until the end of the world the true creator of Christian union and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried. And all scripture is a testimony to Christ who is himself the focus of divine revelation. We're going to be talking about some of these things this morning. Here are the verses that that backs up. And so it's a lot. I'm not going to give you time to write them down. Uh, And we're not going to go through all of these. But I would tell you this this morning. Because of the scriptures, we can know who God is. And so let's spend our remaining moments maybe asking four questions about the scriptures this morning. First, how do we know the Bible is God's word? Now, due to our time that we have together, I'm not going to be able to go into how to prove the existence of the Bible and how it's the word of God based on other resources, like we have extra resources, third-party resources that prove archaeological, scientific. Uh, We could go into all these things that prove that the Bible is the word of God. This morning, we're going to be speaking, speaking mainly from the premise that we are home folk believing that it is the word. And so why do we need to follow and understand that it is the word this morning? Just as we watched in the clip just a couple moments ago, we think about that was introduced to us, this this concept of the second temple writings. Works like first and second Maccabees and Tobit and Judith and Wisdom and Sirach and Baruch and even editions of Esther and parts of Daniel, which the Roman Catholic Church calls their deuterocanonical books. Uh, What about us? We have 66 books of the Bible. Catholics have 73, did we miss something? Or when we think about this issue of wondering about all these different beliefs in the world, we could look at the Mormons who have an extra book known as the Book of Mormon. We could think about the, uh, the Muslims of the day who have the Quran. We could even talk about the Jehovah's Witnesses who claim they have the Watchtower Society to help clarify the Word of God. And so we think about this and we look at all of these things and how do we know that we have the word of God and what it claims for us and that we are to follow. And so how do we know the scriptures that they are the very words of God? This morning for us, just a couple things. First, the Bible claims to have the words of God. In the Old Testament, the phrase, thus says the Lord, occurred over 400 times. Many of the prophets made this statement. And upon making that statement, they were establishing their authority as messengers of God. And from receiving the Lord's words, they were then called upon to take the word of the Lord out to the people. If you think about that type of statement, think of Exodus chapter 5 verse 1. Familiar passage maybe to some as Moses and Aaron went before Pharaoh. They said, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go. That statement came from God through Moses and through Aaron to Pharaoh. Now, time and time again, the Lord spoke to his children and they did something with his words. They spread his word verbally and also through written form in that time period. There were no recording devices back then or video like we have today. And some may say as we look at these verses and think about that of over 400 verses saying, thus says the Lord, some may say, well, then maybe that's all we have to listen to is only those passages that are thus saith or thus says the Lord. I would encourage you to understand this, that that would be a flawed statement based on what the entire Bible tells us. In the New Testament, God spoke to Paul as he wrote to Timothy about the Old Testament writings, and he said this in 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching and for reproof and for correction and for training in righteousness. The very word scripture here in the Greek is the word graphe. It means writing or thing that is written, or even in the sense of what it's talking about, the scripture, mainly the Old Testament scriptures. Of the over 50 occurrences of this word used in the New Testament, it is always used to reference the Old Testament writings. For example, in Mark chapter 12, verse 10, Jesus said, have you not read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. In Psalm 118, verse 22. 
Or even Jesus said in John chapter 7, verse 42, has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village of David? Quoting, of course, from Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But what about the New Testament being the word of God? As this passage alludes to all of scripture being breathed out by God. Even though it referred mainly to the Old Testament of Scripture, it is also meant that any external writing from outside of the canon of Scripture, that which is deemed the very Word of God, understanding that would be classified and not be a part of Scripture. But anything inside of the Word of God that is deemed canon would be classified as Scripture. This occurred in 397 AD at the Council, the council of Carthage. And they established and said these are the books and the letters that should be in the word of God. You know, I even think about what Paul, how he quoted Jesus' words that are found in Luke chapter 10 verse 7. And he calls them scripture. Listen to 1 Timothy 5.18 as he says the words of God are scripture. The words of Jesus are scripture. He says, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain and the laborer deserves the wages. The New Testament writers even knew that their words were from God. Paul once told the Corinthians this in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 27. He said, if anyone thinks that he's a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. Paul was saying the things that I am writing to you are scripture. They are the word of the Lord. And the Bible claims for us this morning to be the very words of the Lord. It's authoritative to us this morning. But also inside of this passage and this thing that we're looking at this morning about this issue about the word of God, we also notice this, that the Bible claims to be truth without any mixture of error. We can also title that veracity, the truth of the word of the Lord. If the Bible is God's word to mankind, and it cannot have, therefore, any mixture of error. David in the Old Testament said it this way, The law of the Lord is perfect. He also said the commandment of the Lord is pure. His son Solomon even put it this way in Proverbs 30 verse 5, Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. And even in the New Testament, our writers said the same thing. The author of the Hebrews said this, It is impossible for God to lie. Jesus told Thomas even about this connection that he had with the Father and how he was God himself in the flesh. He said it this way in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If that is the case, if God's word must be true, I can tell you today that in the original manuscripts that God created and gave to the people throughout history, that is the case. It is completely true and completely trustworthy. As I think about this in this statement, I know that many people today try to search for contradictions to discredit and to disprove the Bible. Here are a couple of things that I believe critics fail to understand about the Bible as they try to disprove its content. The first is this, I believe they fail to understand that context is key. Some could read Psalm 14, 1 where it says there is no God. And say there, the Bible even tells us there's no God. However, we know and understand that we must read the verse in its entirety to understand context. Psalm 14.1 actually says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and they do abominable deeds and there is none who does good. It's important to gain an understanding of context. Amen? Second thing I think about about this issue for critics is this. is to interpret difficult texts in light of clear texts. James says it this way, So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. In that passage, we could look at that and say, well, you have to work to be saved. But that's not exactly what the word of the Lord tells us. That would be a difficult passage. What about an easier passage, a clear passage that would help us? Paul to the Ephesians said it this way in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. This is not a contradiction of one verse over another. This is a clarification inside the very word of God. 
So this is important for us to catch. Understanding faith in the context of a passage is clear. Next, we understood it this way to interpret the difficult text in light of the clear ones. It helps us out. And thirdly, this morning, to help critics in this area is to understand this, that the Bible was physically written and copied by human beings. Humans were inspired by God and wrote what he gave them to write. And at those moments, the word of God was perfect and without any mixture of error. The scriptures were written in a time period of 1,500 years. Can you imagine a work being established today? It's like, you know, you write it and you're like, hey, let's publish it. Boom. But no, this is many different authors putting it together. From Moses until now, the time period of the first written word that we probably would have had would be about a 3,400-year span. That's a lot of copying and pasting without the way of copying and pasting like we have today. It's a lot different. Back then, they would have to have written on animal skins or even plant fibers. And let me tell you, it doesn't last that long. And so from copying, things did not always transfer correctly. And I want to say plainly this morning, of all the errors that are in the Bible today, and yes, there are some that are in the Bible, none of these errors have to do with anything major of what we believe. All of them mostly, a lot of them are numerical errors. Apparently, numbers were tough back then. Anybody have tough times with numbers today? Okay, I do. All right, I was just, just being honest. And so let me give you a for instance here this morning. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 26 the Bible tells us this, and your Bible will say this exact thing, and I, if you have any normal version, it will tell you this. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 26, Solomon also had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Well, 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 25, which is talking about this exact same occurrence, says this, and Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen, and he goes on. Does anybody notice the difference there? 4,000 and 40,000, that's a big difference. In the Hebrew, one little itty bitty dot, iota, tittle, anything like that can change it from a 4,000 to a 40,000. So what happened is we know this throughout history. Many Jewish boys were responsible for recording and for copying and pasting the text from one manuscript to another. And what would happen is that they spent, say, four to six months, which was an average on one manuscript. If they made one little error, the entire parchment was to be destroyed. And so can you imagine a 15-year-old boy coming up to his rabbi who spent six months working on a parchment and actually missed one little itty-bitty mark and says, it's good to go. <laughs> That's probably what happened because they didn't want to say, I'm going to write this whole thing over again for six months working on this work that I messed up on. And so this morning, I want to make sure that I reiterate this. God cannot lie. The word is completely true in the original form that it was first issued when it was given and so it was 100% without error. And today, I preach the word of God without error and know that to be true. Amen? And so if you would like more information on this, there's a, some great articles online. I found a great one. If you just type in a search engine about this North American Mission Board and type in, are there any errors in the Bible? They do a great job of breaking this down. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that. But how do we know that the Bible is God's word? He's given it to us. He's established it. Like I said, we're not going into the scientific, archaeological evidence, which there's tons and tons of proof of that that reveals that our word is the word of God. Many manuscripts above anything that we have in existence to prove our word is truth. But the second thing maybe to ask ourselves this morning is this, is who can understand the Bible? Who can understand the Bible? We talk about clarity this morning. And as we read the Bible, there are some easy passages of Scripture, and there are some extremely difficult passages of scripture. Listen to what Peter once said about Paul's writing. He said, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and even unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 16. Some of the things of Paul's writing are hard to understand. Anybody agree? I agree. There's some things that you're like, what in the world is he talking about? But I'm going to try to figure out, but God has established that his desire is that we understand and that we teach it to each other. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9 talks about this. Just give you a summation of that passage and understanding it this way, that we're to teach each other diligently to your children, to write it as a sign on your hand, frontlets, to establish it on your doorposts in this passage of Scripture. To make sure that we take the Word of God and we continue to teach it to each other. But as we think about this question, 
who can understand the Bible. We must remember that in order to gain further insight into what God's word talks about, we must have a relationship with God to understand its context and its content. And when we put our faith and trust in God, the Holy Spirit enters into us and then gives us further insight into how to understand the spiritual things of God. The Bible tells us that a natural lost person will not have the spiritual ability to ascertain the true meaning of the words of God from intellect alone. It's one thing to be smart. It's another thing to be spiritually connected to God. There's a scripture that tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2, a smart person could read Hannah's prayer where it says, There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. And they could say, wow, the Christians worship a rock, an inanimate object. I don't know about you, that's not who we worship. When we're spiritually appraised to the things of God, we know that this is metaphorical language, talking about our God is strong, he is stable, he is immovable, and we can trust in him. As I thought about this and the rocks that people worship, because some people do worship rocks, and apparently people still even think they're pets. You can buy this on Amazon for 20 bucks, a pet rock set. Not to be like I should have come up with this years ago. People are actually going to spend money on a pet rock. Uh, anyway, that's the reality we live in. But if you're a believer in Christ, the Holy Spirit will guide you into a greater understanding of his word. And he will help bring clarity to you. Listen to what Paul told the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. He said, And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual to be able to do that now let me talk to you this morning if you're struggling in understanding some of the bible and its contents i want to give you some practical tips this morning to help you out to understand the bible better all right so if you're taking notes here's some good ones first one is this pray pray about it some people skip right by this step And I want to encourage you, if you're trying to figure out how to understand the Bible, the best thing you can do is go to the source of who created it. God, give me wisdom to understand and to discern your truth. The second thing I thought about was this, is read the verse in its context. As we mentioned before, you read the verse. If you don't understand that, read the paragraph. If you still don't get it, read the chapter. If you still don't understand it, read the book or the letter in its entirety. And then finally, look at all of Scripture to try to figure out what it's talking about. Or maybe the third thing this morning is phone a friend. You can ask a fellow believer to assist you in fighting out and figuring out this Bible passage. You may be surprised that maybe they're struggling with the exact same thing you are. And they're like, I don't know what it's talking about either. Or maybe the fourth thing is read a commentary. There are hundreds of commentaries out there featuring biblical scholars and pastors and even lay people. They can help to offer a great opinion about the text. Now, let me make sure I say that again. It's an opinion because the commentaries that are out there, I want to make sure I explain this very succinctly. They're not infallible. The word of God is infallible, but we as human beings can have an opinion and be wrong. And so I pray that you would trust that and understand, hey, they may be wrong. I can tell you this on occasion. I read some commentaries. I'm shocked by their discoveries. But some are great and some can help you out. So there's a couple things. I want to give you a fifth thing. Maybe it's this, is to talk to Chris Ramsey, (laughs) our minister to music. Uh, In in that way, of course, talk to a minister. Talk to Dave, myself, Kendra, Chris. uh, Even Josh has gone through Liberty University and is currently working on his master's there. And so not to say we know it all because we don't. There'll be times when you say, hey, I got this thing. And I'll say, well, let me look it up and let me get back to you. But we want to help you to figure out sometimes some of these harder passages of Scripture. So how do we know that the Bible is God's Word? He tells us it's the very Word of God. Who can understand the Bible? It's those who put their faith and trust in Him and know who they are in Christ. Thirdly, this morning, as we ask this question, is the Bible really necessary to know God? Is the Bible necessary to know God? Let me answer this by saying yes. The Bible is necessary for faith. The Bible tells us about Jesus Christ, the man who was born, who lived a sinless life, who died for our sins upon the cross, who rose victorious of the grave, that we could have faith in him and have everlasting life. We look to John 14, verse 16, where Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And John even put it this way in John 3, 18, whoever believes in him is 
not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. In order to have true faith, we must know Jesus Christ. How do we know about Jesus Christ? It's the Word of God that tells us it. So yes, the Bible is completely necessary for faith. I thought of what Paul told the church at Rome about this in a little mini sermonette for you this morning. In Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 17, this is what he said, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And how then will they call unless in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him on whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? And so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Five principles emerge here about the necessity of the word of God. Look at the first one. One must call upon the Lord for salvation. It's found here in the Word of God. Everyone who calls upon His name will be saved. This is Jesus Christ whom the Scriptures talk about. And the second thing found in this passage is in verse 14 at the beginning. One must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. All of this is in Scripture, it tells us. This is why it's necessary to have faith and an understanding through His Word. He said, how then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? You believe that he is the Lord and that he is worthy of our crying out to him for salvation. And this also means that we believe and he will save us in this passage. Third thing I noticed in verses 14 through 15 is that people must hear about Jesus to be saved. And it tells us this in the word of God. And how are they to believe in him on whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? It is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. If we don't use the scriptures and tell people about Jesus, how will they know about Jesus? God chose human beings as his vessels, as an instrument to tell other human beings about Jesus and his word. Fourthly, in this passage, saving faith comes, I believe, from receiving the gospel message. All of this is found in the word. But they have not all obeyed the gospel for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Maybe you have never received this message today. Saving faith comes from hearing the gospel message. That God has now given you access to him through his death and burial and resurrection from the cross. And you're able to hear that message today because it has been preached. It has been proclaimed from the word of of God. And that's our calling this morning, to take this good news message to the ends of the earth, to tell them, here is the word, it's necessary for faith. Now let me make sure I explain this. You don't have to have your Bible on you for them to come to know Jesus Christ. You can talk to them about the Bible, but it is completely necessary to know God. Fourthly and finally this morning as we close, are the scriptures enough? To know what God wants me to do. Is it sufficient for my life? I can tell you this. The Bible is sufficient for faith and for practice. Something to note here about the Bible. As Wayne Grudem put it. I love this statement. Scripture contained all the words of God. He intended his people to have at each stage of redemptive history. And that it now contains all the words of God we need for salvation. For trusting him perfectly and for obeying him perfectly perfectly found in his systematic theology work what a great statement and after we express faith in jesus christ what's next what do we do with the faith that we have the bible tells us exactly what we are to do as followers of christ the word of god shows us how we might practically live out our faith in him you know we started off talking about second timothy chapter 3 verse 16 i want to read that verse for you again and also give you verse 17 All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The very word of God, the scriptures, the Bible tells us here in this passage, it is profitable for us. That word in the Greek means this, it's helpful. 
It's advantageous for us. It brings forth great profit in our lives. The word of the Lord, when we use it, can benefit us greatly as we seek to live out our lives for him. But the key is, is that we take it, we read it, and we apply it to our lives. Something to note here when we talk about the sufficiency of the Bible and what it means to us today. The Bible, granted, does not always teach us everything we know about how to make it through each day on this earth. It doesn't teach us how to drive a car through the snow. It doesn't teach us how to bake a cake or make chocolate chip cookies. It doesn't tell us how to operate our computers. It doesn't tell us how to perform well at the jobs that we have. It's not sufficient for that type of stuff, but it's not needed for that type of stuff. Because for us, the Bible is completely sufficient for everything that we need to know about how to have faith in God and how to practice out that faith on this earth. Thank you for that. Amen. I was about to amen myself. The Bible, listen, may not teach us everything we need to know about living on this earth. But listen, it does teach us about everything we need to know about living forever in heaven when we leave it. That's exactly what the Bible shows us and is there to help us and encourage us. This morning, I pray that we think about the Bible, how it's authoritative, it's given to us. It is the very words of God, the scriptures, the clarity that it helps us to understand it when we put our faith and our trust in him through which by we know and understand it is a necessity to have the word of God so that we may live it out sufficiently in our lives as we seek to practice our faith out. Amen? Amen. One more thing before I close, I want to remind you, don't forget about this afternoon at three o'clock. I would encourage you to come back, spend some time with us as we get to discuss uh, Josh and Sarah and their family potentially coming as our next student pastor in our church. And so we're excited with that opportunity to discuss them at three o'clock. Please make sure you do. Don't forget, if you do not get to see the question and answer, our website, ridgecrest.org. Go to it, click on the media link, click on the special events, and you'll be able to see it posted there online. All right? Man, praise the Lord. I love the scriptures. What about you? It's a great thing to have. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father.